Hello, everybody. Um, so I get to go to Turkey this summer, and I'm going to tell you about it. Um, this is a great place for a world history teacher to get to go because um, it has such a rich history. And before I say anything else, I just want to thank uh, the family of Elie Saddard Siebold, who made this gift to uni um, in order to allow teachers to do unconventional professional development. And they funded uh, my trip, um, and I'm very grateful uh, to have received that financial support that made this possible. So thank you so much. Um, so before I dig into my personal trip, I just want to give a little bit of background in the history of this region of Anatolia, sometimes known as Asia Minor. It's the home of the modern nation of Turkey. Given Anatolia's position at the crossroads between Europe and the civilization's Western Asia, it shouldn't be surprising that it's that it's been influenced by many peoples and cultures over the last 4,000 years. And I can just go through a, you know, just a truncated list of many of the people who have influenced Turkey over the years. One of these is the Hittites. Uh, they became the first major empire to control Anatolia starting around 1600 BCE. Uh, by the 8th century BCE, Greeks were beginning to colonize the coast of Anatolia. The Aegean coast of Anatolia became known as the home of the so-called Ionian Greeks. And you can see it on the map here, one of the areas that's in green. Um, even after new conquerors eventually took over this land, the kind of Greek uh, cultural heritage continued to live on in the form of culture and language. One such conqueror that took over the region over the years um, was the Persian Empire, who took over the Greeks along with the Anatolian kingdoms of Lydia and Lycia and others, along with everything else that's in orange on this map. Although the Ionian Greeks had eventually gained independence, the Persians largely controlled Anatolia until the conquest of... You may remember Alexander the Great. Um, he's able to start in his homeland of Macedonia, conquer Greece. Well, his father conquered Greece. Um, and then he conquered uh, all of this area in Asia, um, including the Persian Empire. Now, as you might remember, Alexander was a good conqueror, but he didn't necessarily leave it in shape to remain united. And so what follows is the Hellenistic era in which various kingdoms controlled different parts of what Alexander conquered. This is so-called the Hellenistic world. So um, Anatolia during this time period was under different Hellenistic kings until the Roman Empire. Uh, so during the Roman era, starting around 146 BCE, uh, Rome was in charge of this area of Anatolia or Asia Minor. Among many important things that happened during this time period, um, uh, Rome saw the birth of Christianity. And in Turkey plays a major role in the history of early Christianity because it's the site of many of the Apostle Paul's missionary travels. And so we can see this on this map, uh, how, uh, how many of his travels were actually in Turkey. Now, eventually, the Roman Empire is going to split into two halves. The western half eventually disintegrated, um, but the eastern half, the so-called Byzantine Empire, lasted another thousand years. And during this period, Constantinople grew to be one of the largest and most powerful cities in the world. But over the centuries, the Byzantine Empire began to lose territory, first to the Arabs and then to the Turks, which is uh, the name of an originally nomadic people who converted to Islam. One Turkish dynasty, the Seljuks, uh, pushed into Anatolia in the 11th century. After the Mongols took out the Seljuks, another group of Turks called the Ottomans finished off the Byzantine Empire. Uh, the pivotal event here was the conquest of Constantinople in 1453, which is depicted here in a 1902 painting. Uh, during the Ottoman Empire, the Turks uh, inhabited Anatolia and made the peninsula the heartland of a huge Islamic empire that spanned three continents. Uh, one of the world's most powerful empires in the 16th century, the Ottomans began to decline, began to decline and eventually crumble in the 18th and 19th century. In the wake of the Ottoman Empire's collapse at the end of World War I, Mustafa Kemal, later known as Ataturk, led a nationalist revolution that founded the modern nation of Turkey as a secular state. So thus, you can see, Turkey has this really rich history, um, you know, dating all the way back to the Hittites, Rome, Greece, Byzantines, Islam, modern Turkey, uh, so many different uh, layers to this past. Now, you see here the itinerary for my trip. Um, this uh, starts in Istanbul and ends in Istanbul. So starting in Istanbul, a great city that kind of shows the rich history of the area. It started as a Greek colony, Byzantium, eventually uh, founded by Constantine as the new capital um, of what became the eastern half of the empire. Um, and then when the Ottomans took over, it became known as Istanbul. Um, one uh, thing about Istanbul is it's, uh, I dare you to find many cities that span multiple continents. On the left, you can see part of Istanbul is in Europe, and the other part of it is in Asia. You can see that on the right. 
Now, I saw lots of sites in Istanbul, including the Blue Mosque, which you see on the left, and the Suleiman Mosque on the right, and most famous, the Hagia Sophia, um, another building which speaks to this richly layered history of Turkey. So, in terms of the Greek past, some of the pillars you see in the background here are actually drawn from one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, the Temple of Artemis. Um, this is from the ancient Greek settlement of Ephesus. Now, the next phase is that the Hagia Sophia was originally built as a place of Christian worship. We know that Christianity has a very deep history in Turkey. Uh, the Hagia Sophia resides in Constantinople, which was, as we know, established as the, quote, New Rome um, by one of Christianity's most significant converts, the Emperor Constantine. In this picture, we see Constantine and the Emperor Justinian, who actually built the Hagia Sophia, kind of donating uh, the Hagia Sophia to the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus. Now, when the Ottomans conquered Constantinople, they turned it into the mosque, into a mosque. And you can see here in this picture, you can see the Arabic that has been placed within this former cathedral. Um, you can also see this uh, painting of an angel, and that angel used to have a face. But as you might remember, um, according to Islamic tradition, one should only revere the word of Allah, and therefore faces are not depicted in religious iconography. Now, ultimately, when Ataturk takes over in the 20s, um, he embarks on this secular program. And so it's not going to be a mosque anymore. It's going to be a museum. So you can see in this one building, we can see very much of the, much of the history of Turkey. So after Istanbul, um, here is me in the ISFPS, uh, sorry, with my partner. And I want to assure you that, uh, that the Stoddard funds did not go to fund her trip. It just went to fund mine. So after Istanbul, we went, to, uh, we went to an area called Cappadocia, which is a, a truly remarkable place. Uh, basically, a, a volcano erupted 60 million years ago. And then over the next 60 million years, wind and rain gradually sculpted it away. And so you end up with this very bizarre, beautiful landscape. And like many visitors to Cappadocia, I uh, got a sense of what this landscape was like by boarding a hot air balloon. You can see the different balloons in the sky from a picture I took. Um, here's a picture that I took from within the hot air balloon. Here we've dropped into a valley. And here's a picture from way above that I was able to get from the balloon. Back on the ground, I took a picture of the way in which the Cappadocian landscape has been domesticated. You can see people here have built caves, homes uh, within the soft volcanic rock. We also visited a former monastery in Cappadocia. We weren't able to take a picture inside the chapel, uh, but we were able to get pictures of this room where the monks ate. If you can see, uh, that's a picture of the Last Supper. You can hardly make that out, but that's what it is. Um, another amazing feature of Cappadocia was this so-called underground city, which was built by persecuted heretical Christians who carved the complex into the soft rock. Uh, pictures don't do justice to this experience, um, but you can see the map on the right, and you can see how complex the tunnels were. Next up, we visited the southern coast of Turkey. Admittedly, this is the decadent part of the trip, which included time at the beach um, and basking in the Mediterranean on our boat trip. But even during this phase, we found some good historical stuff. Uh, check out the ruins of Olympus. This is not the Olympus in Greece. It's Olympus in Turkey, an originally Lycian settlement that was later absorbed by Greeks and Romans. Then in Dalian, there are these amazing tombs for kings that were carved into the mountainside over 2,000 years ago. Um, to give some perspective, you can see, can you see the tombs halfway up this mountain? So it's very high up. We also visited the ruins of Kaunas, uh, which is a few kilometers away from the rock tombs. Uh, these are the ruins of the Doric Temple that was built during the period of Greek settlement. If you look closely, you can see the circular slab in between the two remnants of the pillars, um, which was probably the sacrificial altar at the temple. We also visited Pamukkale, which is named for the magnificent white cliffs that have bought, uh, brought visitors here for centuries. And that's not snow. It's about 100 degrees out. It's actually calcium carbonate, um, which creates that white color. Thanks to the white cliffs and the thermal baths, the sizable Greco-Roman city of Heropolis grew up here as like a vacation destination, a spa city. Here I am with Melissa um, in the theater at Heropolis. Look carefully at the stone atop of this entryway to this tomb, and you can see why it's called the Tomb of the Gladiators. On the left, you can see an amphora, which would have held oil. That would have been like a trophy for a victorious gladiator. Um, in the middle, you see a trident, which would have been a weapon. And then on the right, you see a circle, which would have been a shield. And you can see why historians speculate that this is the home of slain gladiators, or at least the tomb of slain gladiators. Our next stop was Selçuk, which is a city on Turkey's Aegean coast. Um, it shares the same name as the Selçuk Turks um, that controlled much of Anatolia during the early part of the second millennium. 
Uh, Celtic's most significant area today is known as Ayashola Kill. Uh, like the Hagia Sophia, it epitomizes the rich layered history of the region's history. Uh, so, uh, according to the Christian tradition, St. John the Apostle was buried here and even wrote his gospel here. Um, that's why the Byzantines uh, built this cathedral here. They built this basilica. And you can, so you can see the aerial view on the top, and you can see the ruins on the bottom. Um, eventually, the Seljuk Turks took over and turned it into a mosque, though it was eventually destroyed after that by Tamerlane, um, the, uh, the, the nomadic uh, warlord who was able to destroy uh, much that was in his path. Further up the hill, uh, you'll find a citadel that has been restored to what it would have looked like in its Seljuk Ottoman phase, and you can see me in the top there. After Seljuk, we visited Ephesus, which was an extremely populous and powerful city in the Imperial Roman Empire, and also has the best preserved ruins in Turkey. Here's the famous Library of Celsus. Here, I like this picture, a cat sits in the ruins of the Basilica Stoa, or the Royal Colonnade, uh, and that was built in the first century AD. Can you figure out what's going on here? If you guessed latrines, you're right. That's where people would have went into the bathroom, or at least people who went to the luxury latrines in the city. Uh, this is here a view from inside the enclosed climate-controlled complex in which numerous terrace homes from the period are being excavated. You're, you're kind of looking down a hillside, and you're seeing all of these homes, and just the ceilings are now gone, so you're just looking inside of them. Here's the interior of one of the homes, and amazingly, we can still see uh, once we've excava excavated, we can still see the painting on the wall. We can still see the mosaic of the lion on the floor. It's really quite remarkable. The next place I went to was the uh, archaeological site of Troy, uh, famous from the Trojan War and Homer's Iliad. Um, according to Greek mythology, the legendary Trojan War started when Paris wooed Helen of Sparta with some divine help from Aphrodite. Uh, then Menelaus of Sparta, Helen's husband, somehow got all of his warlord buddies to get his wife back. Um, a look at the map seems to indicate that a more likely motive for Greeks to go to war with Troy would be control of the Dardanelles, which is this little strait, which leads from the Aegean Sea eventually to the Black Sea. Um, but the Helen of Sparta story is more colorful. Now, over the years, Troy's been destroyed by fire, conquest, earthquake, and several times it's been rebuilt. So there's all these different layers at different parts of the excavation. This is what's called Troy 6, which is basically the layer that um, would have that this is the Troy of the Iliad, of what the Iliad would have been depicted. Now, uh, another Troy story here is a painting that depicts um, the, uh, a scene from the mythic poetry of Virgil of Aeneas fleeing Troy um, before going off to be the founder of Rome. Um, Melissa and I did our best imitation. We didn't remember the prose quite correctly, but we tried. Uh, while at Troy, I also submitted to wearing this very historically accurate warrior outfit and being photographed with some of my traveling companions. Next, we visited the memorial complex commemorating the protracted fight between Turkey and Anzac, the Australia-New Zealand Army Corps during World War I. Uh, this has become very important in Australian memory, the stuff that gets taught over and over again to Australian students. Above, you see the Lone Pine Cemetery of buried Anzac soldiers. Now, the thing is, on the other hand, this battle is also very significant in Turkish history because the Turkish victory turned Mustafa Kemal into a national hero. He would later lead the Turkish nationalist movement overthrowing the Sultan and took the name Ataturk, literally father of the Turks. Almost 75 years after his death, Ataturk still possesses, uh, possesses a cult of personality that shows up everywhere from prominent monuments to kitschy souvenirs as seen in this wine bar in Sarincha. So back to the battle, this World War I battle made Ataturk famous, so the Turks have their own memorials to this defining moment in their own history. Uh, sometimes the Anzac and Turkish memorials even exist side by side. Here we see the Turkish memorial on the left and the New Zealand one on the right, so creating this very interesting situation. Finally, we wrapped up the trip by returning to Istanbul. Um, by this point, it was Ramadan, so we headed to Ayup, which is this neighborhood um, in Istanbul where a lot of people gather to break the fast. Uh, this breaking of the fast is called iftar, and it's quite festive. Uh, here's one of the crowds all gathered together um, to break the fast at sundown. Uh, here is outside of a mosque, a number of women gathering to break the fast. 
and here is uh, here I am breaking the fast. Now, I made very clear that I hadn't actually fasted that day, but still a member of the Moss Iftar community wanted us to join them in eating, and so he gave us um, the simple meal that they were using to ceremonial break the fa ceremonially break the fast, which includes bread, cheese, dates, tea, and so forth. Um, and then after this, they would have gone somewhere else to have a very, uh, a very uh, more, th uh, more uh, nourishing meal after not eating the entire day. Um, the following day, our final day in Turkey, we went to Topkapi Palace, which is uh, the palace that would have housed the sultan during the heyday of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, this diorama that's at the site gives sense of what the grounds of Topkapi Palace uh, are like, and it's not bad, as you can see. Indeed, as you go around Topkapi Palace, basically what you keep saying to yourself is, you know, man, that's fancy. And certainly there's a lot of very fancy things. Here's one example, which is a pavilion that was built in the 17th century. During our last night in Istanbul, uh, we traveled to a different neighborhood um, in, a part of, uh, in a part of the city that was on the Asian side, and here I am on the Bosphorus heading back towards Europe. Um, if you can see, uh, looking out my uh, window, you can see the Hagia Sophia on the right, and you can see Top Copy Palace on the left as it looks from the Bosphorus, which is this strait of water that uh, divides the eastern uh, and the western, the Asian and the European parts of the city. So at last, uh, the trip had come to an end. Um, I was left with many fine memories, including this one of standing alone on the stage of the Great Theater at Ephesus. Um, thanks so much to the Stoddard family for the financial support and allowing me to make this trip, uh, which was able to kind of document all of the different phases of world history that we can see illuminated by a trip in Turkey.